My pseudonym is Skunkworks, and today I'm going to be talking to you about hard drive anti-forensics. My talk's entitled, and that's how I didn't lose an eye, emergency data destruction. Uh, oh yes, and by the way, the uh, picture up there is what used to be a hard drive platter after some modified thermite was applied to it. It's, uh, as I believe I said in my paper abstract, about as forensically useful as a wet noodle now. Um, so first a little bit about me. I'm an undergrad in electrical engineering at a major U.S. research university. Uh, I do a lot of, well, an insane amount of my own R&D outside of school in my basement in suburban Maryland. I'm experienced in basically everything from non-destructive entry to CUDA, VoIP to Tesla coils. I'm just a tinkerer. I love building stuff. And uh, that's why I took on the Shmoo Group's hard drive data destruction challenge and succeeded in it. I'm cutting class to speak at ShmooCon. I actually had to cut Friday double E class to uh, make the flight out. So starting out, um, I learned about the data destruction challenge that uh, Potter, Olam, and Lawson put out at, uh, at DEF CON. Um, they gave a talk, and that's how I lost an eye, exploring emergency data destruction, where they talked about their own failures in designing a uh, 3U rack mount server sized uh, hard drive enclosure that's capable of destroying a hard drive in 60 seconds or less without collateral damage. Um, they failed pretty epically at it. <laughs> I'm going to play the video in a second. Uh, and I decided to go ahead and pick this up because, you know, in Soviet DC, Shmukhan pay you if I do this and speak here. I get the speaker's fee, and I just love building stuff. So the other thing with hard drive anti-forensics is there's this recent court case up in the uh, Northwest. I forget exactly the title of it. But uh, apparently, Fifth Amendment rights do not apply to hard drives, according to this judge. So. There's obviously a lot of interest in anti-forensics due to that also. Continuing on, uh, video is worth, you know, if they say picture's worth a thousand words, video is worth a million or two to twenty in binary. So I'm going to go ahead and play a video that's kind of the worst of the worst of, uh, of the Schmoo Group's DEF CON presentation where they, uh, yeah, this is like the worst of the worst, but this is the lead up into how I started in anti-forensics for the hard drive challenge. And here we go. One second. Um, what are we doing here? To remotely destroy a drive. Just make the drive go away. And we wanted complete drive destruction, like a pile of slag. Like our first thought was thermite. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of people's first thought because it's fun. Um, you have a one U server. Uh, you have one U above and below to install whatever they want in the rack. So concrete, uh, asbestos, you know, things like that. Um, when you fire the hard drive, you have 60 seconds to destroy it. You must not set off fire suppression, smoke sensors, seismic sensors, because we're near banks. Um, must not harm other system in, in, the, in the rack, and you must not harm the humans that happen to be nearby when you're lighting off your thermite or magnesium or something like that. So there were certainly times when we thought something really bad was going to happen. <laughs> so we, we initially split this up into three areas, uh, incendiary, which was deviance, um, area of focus, chemical, which was Shane, and physical, which is mine. We're going to go through the efficacy of each of these. Um, As Bruce pointed out, incendiary, it actually, it, it's because there's only two ways you can do this. One is thermite, which doesn't, you know, play nice with anything, or doesn't play nice with ceramics, which there's a lot of in circuitry and hard drive platters. So that really much just kind of leaves you with explosive blow, blow the crap out of everything, which fails miserably at all the conditions we set for this situation. So, moving right along, I don't have any great pictures or anything. So the point of the chemical destruction, I was going to spray a mist that goes in to the platters, eats it away, end up having a big bu bubbling pile of what used to be a platter. So how do I know it didn't work? Well, because it didn't work. Um, <clears throat> the slide's in the wrong spot, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, there you go. Um, so the idea with physical destruction was we were going to grind stuff down, uh, hence the term physical destruction. Um, it, it, uh, absolutely really nothing happens. Here's the kicker. We failed. We failed in a big, gnarly, nasty way. And you said, awesome! That's what DEF CON Friday is all about. Yeah, woo! One person's woo! excited, the rest of you like, we're going to beat him up in the alley later. <laughs> we're going to get Lawrence Fishburne and we're going to redo that scene from 21. Yeah, that's you. So I was the one guy who was excited. Uh, 
I saw an opening here, the data destruction challenge, and I was like, okay, Shmoo Group might have failed at this, but I want to try and do this. I want to try and do this properly. I'm going to build that 3U server. This is going to work. And I actually got a little cocky at first, and I've got to admit, starting off, um, I probably wasn't doing much better. Uh, I first figured, why not try lye, sodium hydroxide. It doesn't play very nicely with aluminum. If anyone's ever uh, tried subjecting aluminum to a concentrated solution of sodium hydroxide, it fizzes and dissolves and puts out a lot of hydrogen gas. I figured hard drive platters made out of aluminum, just put some lye solution in there and that should take care of your forensics issue. Turns out that indeed the coating on hard drives is really resilient and it's not only on the top, it's also on the sides and basically the hard drive platter is just sealed 360 and unless there's a nick in it to start with, which isn't very conducive to an operational hard drive, uh, lie is just not very viable. Uh, so I decided to kind of continue and maybe uh, look at a couple new avenues and uh, that's when I decided to go with a high voltage transformer, generate some very high temperature plasma on the surface of the hard drive. And this actually did work. I ended up using a microwave oven transformer. For those who aren't familiar, that's around a 2.1 kilovolt transformer in the range of uh, 700 to 2,000 watts, depending on the microwave. You have 120 volts in, as I said, 2.1 kV out. And uh, it can jump a fairly good gap between two electrodes. I ended up using a couple uh, very high current carbon uh, motor brush electrodes and I'd have them positioned on either side of the platter, one on the top, one on the bottom, and then I uh, spun the platter up and uh, while the platter was spinning I uh, applied the high voltage arc and that did a very good job of it partially melted the platter and it completely charred the surface of it. The plasma generated was I hear two to three times hotter than the surface of the sun usually for an arc like that but regardless it had no trouble destroying the platter. The main problem with that though is first off you can't do it to a stock hard drive. You have to open up the hard drive in an ISO 5 clean room if you want long term operation of the hard drive. And sure an ISO 5 clean room is not the hardest thing in the world to get access to but it, uh, it kind of seems like winning a don't blink contest by starting with your eyes closed in my opinion even though I did technically meet the requirements. Uh, so I decided to kind of go back to the drawing board after this, even though it worked. Um, and then there was also another really larger issue, uh, aside from having to modify the hard drive, and that was the power problem. If you're just doing this to one hard drive, it's really not so much of an issue. But if you've got an entire data center that has to go away, well, all the hard drives have to go away in a matter of 60 seconds, you're going to be replacing your accounting department with a nuclear power plant as far as power requirements go. I mean, you're talking easily tens of megawatts to uh, destroy thousands of hard drives and that is just not viable, let alone if the uh, bad guys who are storming your data center cut power, um, you're just, you're not going to be destroying those drives given the way that uh, there's so much energy required using electric arcs. So that's when I kind of went back to the drawing board and decided to think about things on a much kind of higher level. I broke it down into uh, really two kind, of, uh, two kind of facets to the problem. One was destroying the hard drive, the second was protecting the surroundings. So the first one I just decided to think about, you start with a bunch of bits that are in order and mean something and your goal is just to get to entropy. It doesn't really matter how you get there, you just need to take this platter and uh, remove the order to the bits and then you need to protect the surroundings if that is uh, destructive enough and it doesn't just kill the platter. So incendiary really did seem the logical choice, some type of chemical incendiary that will melt the platter or just demagnetize it. And uh, that's when I kind of started to get back into thermite work because Schmoo Group never really tried thermite. I actually talked with Bruce yesterday, I heard the main reason was due to uh, just the smoke and that indeed was a large issue for me but I finally eliminated that through two different ways. So moving on, I uh, ended up making a quick visit to Hackaday and indeed there's already been thermite data destruction done. Uh, this was featured on Hackaday something like three or four years ago, I'm not exactly sure on the time. But uh, destruction is really only half the battle. I mean you don't want that in your data center if you're a sysadmin. That is not only going to set off fire suppression, that's going to eat through the floor. 
Uh, it's going to set your whole data center on fire. That is just not viable. So you've obviously got a lot of issues in fire protection engineering here <clears throat> if, you're going <coughs> if you're going to be using uh, stock thermite. Um, <clears throat> So then we come to the not losing an eye part. Once I'd settled on uh, thermite as an incendiary, uh, incendiary compound or a thermite derivative, I went ahead and purchased a full fire proximity suit off of eBay. Um, this, yes, <laughs> and, and fire entry suit gloves. The gloves are actually rated for uh, short duration contact to 2000 Fahrenheit. So as long as you're not placing a pile of thermite on your head and setting it off, this is very excellent at protecting you. If you ever watch Mythbusters episodes where they work with thermite, Jamie Heineman's always the one wearing this. So about 170 bucks off eBay. I had safety pretty well taken care of. And then I'd also like to add, throughout the course of my thermite experimentation, I was very careful about uh, not setting fires in the surroundings. Uh, whenever I was setting off amounts larger than around 10 grams that had the possibility of throwing off a lot of slag, a lot of sparks and the like, I would always do the experiment in a four foot deep pit dug in my backyard. And um, the pit, I cleared all flammable material in a 10 foot radius and had an 80 pound bag of concrete over top of the pit that could be deployed into it as sort of a scram measure if a reaction ever got out of hand. And fortunately, that never happened, plus I had plenty of fire extinguishers nearby. And uh, that, on the safety side, really worked well. I didn't want to repeat all too many accidents you see on YouTube where people are just being idiotic with uh, highly dangerous chemicals and something bad ends up happening. Um, so much to do about thermite. Probably a lot of you aren't super familiar with thermite. I'd hope a lot of you have at least heard of it. But it's a lot hotter than the lava pictured. Thermite generally burns somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, you know, 3,000 to 4,000 Fahrenheit, depending on the exact composition. Uh, it's about two-thirds as hot as the surface of the sun, and it's also a very difficult reaction to initiate. Um, it generally takes magnesium and electric arc or something else that burns it at an insanely hot temperature. In fact, usually hotter than the thermite to set it off. You can have thermite glowing red hot and it will not go off. And uh, for those of you who are curious, the exact chemistry behind regular thermite is 2.96 uh, units by weight to one unit by weight of ferrous oxide to aluminum powder. And generally, the finer the powder, the quicker the reaction is going to go, and also the easier it's going to be to set off. I used 30 micron powder on both for uh, all of my initial experiments. Continuing on, I wanted to establish a baseline as to what reliably destroyed a hard drive. So I fired a series of, I believe, around eight or nine hard drives before I came to, rea uh, came to the realization that around one kilogram of thermite was necessary to reliably get a hard drive fully destroyed. Um, I tried this with a bunch of different drives. I tried, you know, everything from older six platter uh, SCSI drives to some older single platter like 40 gig IDEs to a few newer SATA drives and, you know, everything basically between one and six platters I tried and it seemed pretty universal that a kilogram was safe. Well, not as much safe as safe for destroying the data. Um, then the big problem with regular thermite is it tends not to stop with just destroying the hard drive. It produces a lot of molten steel, or molten iron actually in this case, not, not really any carbon in there. And that will go right through the hard drive in general. Um, so when you're destroying the platter, usually you have a lot of burn through. And that can be, again, a huge issue if you're in a data center environment. Again, we get a lot of fire protection engineering issues, even though this kind of solves destroying the drive. So I decided to try and modify the regular thermite composition a bit. There are a few others out there. There's thermate TH3, which is common. That's um, about 26% by weight barium nitrate. That's used very commonly in uh, military incendiary grenades for anti-material purposes. Uh, it's also, I've heard, been used a lot for destroying sensitive data like cryptographic equipment and other things that you just can't have reverse engineered if it gets into the wrong hands. So what I wanted was to modify the uh, thermite composition in such a way that it would burn through the drive, but it, that it would do more damage to the drive than to anything else and, uh, you know, hopefully not burn through and set your data center on fire. Uh, what I decided would be a good strategy would be to have excess oxidizer, usually the ferrous oxide being the oxidizer in the aluminothermic regular thermite reaction. Um, but ferrous oxide is not necessarily going to be super reactive in general as an oxidizer, so I was looking for something that maybe had a little bit of a lower melting and decomposition temperature. 
And this led me to a lot of exothermic research and development, which at least in the beginning was quite fun. So moving on, we've got calcium sulfate, which was a uh, logical next step to replace some of the ferrous oxide as a bit of a higher temperature, more powerful oxidizer. Um, calcium sulfate-based thermite is indeed the most energetic kind that's commonly made. Uh, it burns a good bit hotter than regular thermite. Um, it seemed a pretty logical choice for data destruction. The only interesting thing about it is I tried putting 200 grams of it on top of a hard drive, which with regular thermite is generally sufficient to enter the hard drive, albeit not destroy all the platters thoroughly, but enough to at least burn through. And despite the calcium sulfate-based thermite having more energy and burning hotter, it failed drive entry. And after uh, looking at a lot of high-def videos of it, and uh, watching a couple very small reactions in the 10 gram range up close in my fire proximity suit, I finally came to the conclusion that the reason it was doing this was it doesn't produce very much slag. The uh, ferrous oxide and aluminum-based thermite uh, produces a lot of slag in the form of uh, iron uh, and molten iron and aluminum oxide, whereas the calcium sulfate-based thermite produces mostly calcium sulfide and aluminum oxide, and that is not as, uh, that slag has a much lower heat capacity, and as a result it tends not to burn through stuff as well, and you end up more with the thermite just kind of burning away on top, and only perhaps the last quarter inch of it or so if it's on the very top of the drive actually, uh, actually does much to the hard drive. So with slag production too low with calcium sulfate alone, I decided to keep looking and I kind of embarked on what's very familiar to computer scientists, a binary search. I don't have a PhD in computational chemistry. I can do basic stoichiometrics, but I was not about to come up with a ton of mathematical models for the ideal thermite for burning through a hard drive. So I just decided to start adding stuff to the mixture and see what it did in small quantities. And if it helped, I'd add more of it until it stopped helping. And if it didn't, I'd, you know, move on to something else. And I ended up going through a lot of different fuels and oxidizers. I'd uh, do little tests on 18-gauge sheet steel. Um, what, what I was looking for is something that burned the steel very well but didn't have that much pour through. You know, it would, uh, it would burn it, but it wouldn't put a lot of molten slag through there that can continue on down lower and lower. Uh, the process involved, as I said, taking an additive and tweaking the concentration to find the uh, optimal amount. And it actually got boring after a while. I ended up doing around 300 tests like this where I'd be mixing in, you know, minute quantities of a certain fuel and a certain oxidizer. And uh, it, it, it ended up dragging out for a fairly long time before I finally settled on, um, oh, actually I had things a little out of order, uh, Thermex Composition 210. This was the 210th uh, reaction that I tried. Thermite Experimental Composition 210, and this is 37.5% uh, by weight regular thermite. 37.5 by weight calcium sulfate thermite, which is one part aluminum powder to, uh, I believe, 2.45 calcium sulfate, and 25% by weight potassium nitrate, which is a little bit of a more volatile oxidizer that decomposes at a lower temperature and produces a lot of oxygen. Um, then going back, uh, thermite is indeed very difficult to set off in general. And the Thermex mixture, Thermex C210 that I came up with was uh, a little easier to set off because of the potassium nitrate having a rather low decomposition temperature on the order of I think a couple hundred C, maybe a little higher. But uh, I cannot count the number of times that I saw blue hot magnesium sitting on top of a pile of thermite not igniting it. So in general, you don't have to worry about your thermite going off accidentally. It's more it not going off when it should. What I did ultimately uh, settle on for ignition very reliably was a Marx generator. A lot of you are probably unfamiliar with this. Uh, it's mostly used in pulsed power applications. What this is is basically a specialized capacitor bank that can charge up in parallel and then discharge in series and that produces a very high voltage and a very high peak current, therefore very high peak power over a short period of time. And when you put that over a spark gap, you can produce an insanely hot spark that has no trouble igniting just about any fuel oxidizer mixture you can think up. Um, the other interesting thing I found, which was a little unrelated, but I just decided to 
experiment a little, and that is that it's actually possible to set off thermite with black powder. Uh, Wikipedia says that this is not something that works, and indeed it does work. Um, you can't just put black powder on top of thermite and set it off, but if you mix about 50-50 uh, black powder to thermite, and then you put a little bit of pure black powder on top of that, I used a rather, uh, I actually technically used something referred to as green powder because I uh, omitted the sulfur and I mixed the potassium nitrate and charcoal uh, separately and then mixed the powder together instead of milling the two. But, and that results in something that uh, burns at a much lower rate than regular black powder. But it was a rather interesting discovery that you can indeed set off thermite with black powder just as a bit of a aside. Um, there are also more exotic reactions you can use like potassium permanganate and I believe uh, glycol and that will burn at a high enough temperature to initiate thermite but I pretty much just settled on a Marx generator a bunch of pulse capacitors for my uh, experiments once I'd, uh, once I'd found that to be reliable. So moving on I've actually got a video of the uh, Thermax C210 in action. I will kill the audio because it sounds absolutely dreadful. Um, but here we go. I'll skip to around 30 seconds in because I did use the black powder ignition method for this one. And please forgive me for the camera shake. I was wearing a fire proximity suit at the time. Uh, let me see here. Oh, that's okay. There we go. And you're going to notice in a second here the thermite actually catches. This is the Thermax C210. And this is how it burns. Um, if you were to compare this to a regular thermite burn, you'd basically see that it produces a little bit less in the way of smoke than a regular thermite burn, and it burns a lot hotter and a bit more vigorously. It uh, just goes a little faster. And there you can see uh, that's the entire pit. You've just got smoke rising out of it now, and that's about uh, 200 grams, I think, that went off in there. Give it another sec. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, did, I opted not to bring a live demo today. <laughs> okay. So, moving back to the presentation. Uh, okay. So, that indeed uh, succeeded in entering the hard drive. There I've got a picture from another test, just a still, of a uh, white hot calcium sulfate thermite well, or Thermax, it's got calcium sulfate and potassium nitrate. Um, and that's right after it's gone through the hard drive, and the hard drive is basically filled with slag. You've got that little bit left on top. This is probably 10 seconds after I set it off. And uh, it was very successful, completely anti-forensically destroyed the drive. There is no way you're going to get data off of it again. Uh, but that still leaves a big fire protection engineering challenge, and that's really the secret sauce in this. Destroying a hard drive with thermite is nothing that original. Uh, as I said, it's been done on Hackaday before. It's kind of more of a fire protection engineering here if it was the hard part. Um, the tedious part was mixing 300 some odd compositions of thermites to find the right one. So the goal is to take the data center and have it not turn into that. <laughs> Uh, so, containing the beast, I settled on fire-rated drywall pretty early because it melts at around 1500 C. While this is below the temperature that all the different thermite compositions I'm playing with melt at and burn at, um, it melts rather slowly in the presence of thermite. And in addition, there's a pretty interesting kind of exotic endothermic trick to the way fire-rated drywall works. And that is, fire-rated drywall is calcium sulfate, aka plaster, actually one of the components in my thermite, which is a little ironic. Um, but the difference between the stuff in the thermite and the stuff in the drywall is the stuff in the thermite has absolutely no water in it. It's what's referred to as the gamma anhydrite phase of calcium sulfate. It only forms when you heat the partially hydrated phase above around 300 Celsius. Um, but the gamma anhydrite version is quite reactive chemically in comparison to the hemihydrite. The hemihydrite version is what's in fire-rated drywall. And when the fire-rated drywall is in the presence of a fire, all that water slowly boils out of it, the hemihydrite, referring to the fact that uh, 
for each calcium sulfate atom, there is an average, or each calcium sulfate molecule, sorry, obviously, there is an average of half a water molecule attached to it. And um, what happens when it's exposed to a fire is all that water very slowly boils off. And when that water boils off, that's an endothermic process. And what that basically means is that the uh, drywall cools off as it's being heated and that water's being driven off. So the drywall actually takes a lot more energy to melt than an equal amount of just pure anhydrous calcium sulfate would. And that's kind of a bit of the secret sauce in fire rated drywall and the reason why it was suitable for stopping the thermites like that. So I ended up building a prototype of this box. Uh, I just used 5 eighths fire rated drywall. Um, in that one, a single thickness. And uh, then I went ahead and set off some of the different thermites in it, and I found that even up to uh, 400 grams sitting directly on top of it, there was not burn through. And in fact, the other side of it never got above around 200 Fahrenheit over the entire course of the test, which is quite good. Um, moving on then, uh, there's still a big smoke issue. So that's, uh, you know, I had the box there, and ultimately for the, proto the first prototype, I sealed the top of the box and um, set off the thermite inside, but it still smokes. You know, the smoke pours right out of the box. So what I ended up trying to do for the next version of the prototype, unfortunately I don't have pictures of the last couple that are still sitting at home and I have not photographed them, but um, I, I just put an exhaust pipe on it and that basically met the challenge with the single caveat being you need to have access to exterior ventilation for the data center. So the uh, box back there, it is 3U sized. It meets all the requirements on that. And with the top on and the exhaust pipe, uh, the exhaust pipe again being the only caveat, it meets the challenge. And all the smoke goes out the exhaust pipe instead of, um, instead of pouring out of it. Then moving on though, I did try putting a HEPA filter on it where I'd take the side, I'd take one of the sides off the box and then instead of having the exhaust pipe, what I'd do is I'd have two steel baffles. Uh, one would be located about uh, maybe halfway down the box and the other would be located three quarters of the way down the box, one on the top, one on the bottom. What the baffles do is prevent uh, radiant heat transfer uh, via infrared and visible radiation. And uh, what that does is it prevents the HEPA filter from catching on fire. <laughs> I did not learn this the hard way. I thought of it ahead of time. But then I was able to just take a section of HEPA filter, the type you put in your furnace, and just replace the outer wall with that. And that stopped all the smoke. Pleated paper, HEPA filter. I did also try this with a fiberglass filter, and that actually does reduce some of the smoke. But it still failed pretty horribly. The smoke kind of poured out of the fiberglass and that just wasn't a, uh, wasn't a very good solution to the problem, but the HEPA pleated paper one did do it. So that's the uh, Mark II prototype. I also did decide to go with uh, double thickness fire rated drywall because I had a lot of excess on the height and uh, width for the 3U form factor. I mean, the box back there was 3U, but for the second one, I basically just took the same box, layered some extra drywall inside, and then put up the baffles. And believe it or not, this is actually a rather boring process to watch. When the hard drive gets fired, it just, uh, I mean, the box basically just sits there. You don't see anything. And uh, no, no smoke pours out anymore. And I mean, as uh, I think Bruce put it, you know, what's the reason you don't want to use crypto on this? You just see the crypto and it's like, you know, oh, it's crypto. Yeah, it's working. Yeah. This is actually kind of the same. You just hear a vague hissing noise and it's like, well, your data's gone. Data's gone. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I did use a Marx generator with a couple uh, wires leading in just for ignition on this one. Uh, but probably using some type of glow plug or some other exothermic composition to start things off would be a little better for a production model. The other important thing to point out is my prototype had a materials cost of somewhere in the neighborhood of $10. That's including the uh, thermite. And that's a really cheap solution for a uh, drive destruction or, you know, an, a self-destruction feature on a hard drive. Like most of the uh, hard drives that are currently marketed with self-destruct features in them retail for two or three times or even way more just for a hard drive with a self-destruct feature than a comparable drive without one. And this, in fact, seems to do it rather well in uh, about, as I said, probably under 10 bucks worth of cost. So I accidentally have a whole magnetism. It indeed does work. And I've got a hard drive 
uh, I can actually pass around for a couple people after this. I'll, I'll pass it out after the talk. I've got this hard drive I just photographed, and um, there's basically nothing left of the platter material. Uh, there might be a bit in a couple spots, but I'm sure it's been past 800C, which is the Curie point. And um, that was only actually with a 300 gram charge of the Thermex. If you move up to about 400 grams, it, uh, you can't even really recognize the platter as much. But uh, that's basically my, my prototype. So then going from there, kind of one of the lessons I've learned from this uh, is probably going with a much larger unit that's made out of multiple layers of fire-rated drywall that's uh, capable of containing a lot more hard drives would actually be the best kind of to get an economy of scale. I envision something more like a 20U-sized unit, and then from that 20U-sized unit, you could perhaps put uh, several layers of fire-rated drywall up along with uh, perhaps dozens of hard drives, many kilos of uh, my Thermex or regular thermite. And uh, there are, of course, self-destructing drives that are already out there. But I think something like this is scaled up more instead of a single drive. Or actually, if you look back here, I managed, uh, oh no, I've got, uh, I actually got four drives at 400 grams a piece without causing significant damage to my current prototype. But as I said, I think dozens of drives could possibly work in a much larger unit. And then you can really get economy of scale in place. The other very interesting thing I found is if you do have clean room access and the hard drive has enough extra space inside of the top of the case, which the majority of them do, you can actually get away with putting 10 grams of uh, thermite directly inside the hard drive and uh, use a binder, generally some type of plastic. I use polystyrene. And um, then the uh, thermite with the binder inside the hard drive will destroy the hard drive without any outside collateral damage. You could actually have that hard drive sitting inside a server, and there's so little uh, extra heat that makes it to the outside uh, that it would not damage any other components, most likely, and a very minimal amount of fireproofing would work. Uh, perhaps you could even build a 2.5-inch laptop hard drive into what's usually a 3.5-inch uh, drive enclosure, just to use a little bit of extra space for fireproofing and have uh, and have a thermite charge built right into the drive. Again, though, this kind of would violate the initial uh, challenge specifications, but I thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, end of the talk. Actually, I'm a little bit early on time, but uh, got any questions real quick? OK, yeah? Can you speak up a little? Oh, yes. The uh, question was, with the drywall, can I have a live system operating in there uh, without the uh, overheating issues coming up? And actually, I have not tried with an entire system inside there, but at least a single hard drive inside the drywall. If you have a rather long SATA cable running into the enclosure along with your power, uh, the hard drive can just be in there no problem. If you were to have a live system operating in there, I still doubt it would be an issue. The fire-rated drywall is rather good at preventing... Uh, radiant and, uh, and conductive heat transfer, but I don't think that heat would be a huge issue unless you're running a bunch of GPUs or something inside there also, but frankly, there's no point in firing the entire server. You can just put the hard drive only in the box, have the cables run out of it, and save a lot of equipment costs if you do have to do self-destruction. So any more questions? Yep? Hmm? Oh yes, this is definitely applicable to solid state hard drives. Uh, they're destroyed at a far lower temperature than regular platters. Um, I believe the flash memory can only survive up to maybe a couple hundred C tops. So that would be very easy to destroy them. I, I think you could even get by with a lot less reaction material. And uh, perhaps a lot less fireproofing material also. Okay, anyone else? Oh yes, uh-huh. Oh yes, uh, thus far I've only gone for horizontal mounting, but I can imagine you could possibly get it to work vertically. That just would take a bit of additional work. I'd imagine maybe casting a uh, custom mold out of plaster to kind of guide the thermite into the drive then in a bit of a uh, J shape perhaps. We have a stack of thermite and then the thermite would flow toward the uh, face of the drive. Okay, yeah. Uh, no, I did not actually. I looked up my local fire codes and I didn't do anything in violation of them.
<laughs> oh, yes. Well, uh, I mean, it did put out a lot of smoke, but the uh, rule up in uh, Montgomery County where I was, I believe, was 18-inch flame radius, and I never exceeded that. And you can actually get a uh, permit for bonfires and the like to go a little larger, but I never set off anything larger than that anyway. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I definitely got a lot of neighbor or a lot of looks from the neighbors walking around in a uh, fire proximity suit. They're kind of like, "Huh, what's up with that?" And I'm just like, "Oh, doing some research, you know." <laughs> just a bit of research. Uh, no, actually, I'm just wearing these cuz of the lights over there, but I wore uh, welding goggles under the fire proximity suit the entire time, and uh, I I think I got less ultraviolet exposure over the course of my thermite experiments than you get taking a walk down K Street with your glasses off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyone else? Oh, yeah? Got someone where? Oh, yeah, okay. Yes, that's actually an excellent point, and I'd, I'd meant to touch on that, in fact. Thanks a lot. Um, the potassium nitrate ended up oxidizing the uh, aluminum platters very well, and that's one of the reasons I had a lot less burn through using the uh, custom Thermex C210, as I called it, than the regular thermite, um, because the hard drive actually participated in the thermite reaction, but didn't produce that much slag. So that was, uh, yes, the, what ended up happening is all the slag that did make it into the hard drive had a huge surplus of oxidizer, and then after the coating was burnt off, the aluminum just basically rusted very quickly into aluminum oxide. Yep? You talked a bit about using this in a data center. Mm-hmm. It didn't go much into the use scenarios, but uh, it's more of a comment than a question, but one thing you can do is use uh, disk encryption on all the machines that you security, or, uh, wanted to protect. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That is true. You could just have the uh, keys on a key management server and just destroy that drive. That's a really great idea, actually, and then that would uh, that would work really well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, as one of the jackasses that entirely failed. Thanks a lot. <laughs> really, uh, just really a comment. Great work. Thanks a lot. Uh,